Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so welcome to my session. Uh, as also already mentioned, my name is Mo Rubin, and I am a senior security researcher at Microsoft. I'm mostly interested in finding new attack vectors in the on-prem cloud, and which are mostly related to networking. Sorry. And in this session, we're going to show a new way to perform lateral movement, uh, which involves a bit of on-prem, a bit of cloud, and mostly networking. So our agenda for today, we will first go over the introduction to the key terms. We'll go over some things that you might already know, just to make sure we're all on the same page. Later on, this information will help us understand a bit more about the main uh, topic for today, which is NegoX, which is the new authentication protocol for Azure AD joint devices. Later on, we will see a couple of attacks that allow us to perform lateral movement to another uh, devices. Then we will demo one of the attacks and see how we can hunt for them and finish with takeaways from this session. So let's start with the technical background. Our first topic will be Azure AD joint device. As you may already know, Azure AD joint device is a device which is connected directly to Azure AD and it's managed by Azure AD. In the case of Azure AD joint device, only Azure AD accounts can log into this device and there are no local users uh, by default. You can obviously add them, but by default they does not exist on the, account, on the computer, so only Azure AD accounts can log in. And the main two differences between the on-prem Azure Active Directory joint and to Azure Active Directory joint are first the how you query the organization. In Active Directory, you mostly use LDAP to query the domain controller to get information about the entities and groups and so on in the, in the Active Directory. While in Azure Active Directory, you mostly use Graph API or REST API calls to query Azure uh, for information about your organization. The second main difference is the authentication protocols. While in Active Directory, the authentication protocols are known, NTLM and Kerberos. In Azure Active Directory, the authentication protocols are SAML, OAuth, OpenID, and NegoX, which will be our main topic for today. Uh, a side note, I am going to, I'm not going to talk about hybrid uh, devices. Hybrid devices are connected to both Azure AD and to the on-prem. Everything I'm going to show is applicable to hybrid devices too, but since it's the same and you already know how to perform lateral movement in a domain environment, then I will not talk directly about hybrid, but only to Azure AD joint devices. So when talking about Azure AD joint device, it's important to understand the authenticated connections. We have two main scenarios. The first scenario is when we want to authenticate to SaaS application. In this case, we will use something called a PRT. So for example, when we want to authenticate to SharePoint Online, we will use the PRT to exchange for an access token and get access to the specific application. And the second scenario is where we are sitting on an Azure AD joint device and we want to authenticate to another Azure AD joint device. In this case, we will use something new which is called P2P certificate or a peer-to-peer -peer certificate. This certificate is issued by using the PRT and we will show a bit later how we can get this one. So first, let's understand what PRT is. PRT, as I mentioned, is a primary refresh token, and this is a JSON web token, which contains claim on both the device and the user it was issued for. It means that if a user is connected to two devices, then every device uh, for this same session of the user, every device will have a different PRT, and same for devices. If two, devi two users are connected to the same device, same will be uh, here, and we will have two different PRTs, even though it's the same device. And this PRT can be compared to TGT, Ticket Granting Ticket in the on-prem, where if you have the PRT and the session key bound to the specific PRT, it means that you are authenticated, and this session key which is bound to the PRT proves that you have the authentication material and you don't need to authenticate again. So it's the same as TGT in a way that TGT is being used to exchange for ticket for the resource, the TGS, and the PRTs can be exchanged for an access token to access the specific application, or in our case, it will be used to get a P2P certificate, which will be used to access another Azure AD joint device. So, 
I already mentioned a couple of times. So a P2P Azure AD certificate is a special certificate which is issued by Azure. As you can see, the, uh, the issuer is Azure AD, uh, the, it's MS organization P2P access, so it means that it's only Azure AD, the one who can issue those, issue those certificates. And it's issued for a specific user. And the user is the one who the PRT is related to. So I cannot use PRT to get a, a certificate for another user, but only to the user which is bound to the specific PRT. And this PRT is valid for one hour only, and it's used to access any Azure AD device, uh, in case only if you have permission, obviously. And you, once your device is joined to Azure AD, by default, it will be configured to request a new certificate every time it's needed. So you don't really have to do anything. Every time you want to access another Azure AD device, a new P2P certificate will be issued for you. So now that we have a good understanding of the authentication materials, let's dive into the authentication protocols that will help us and be used later in Negrex protocol. So our first protocol is Kerberos PKE. So a couple of words about Kerberos. As you may already know, Kerberos is an authentication protocol in the on-prem, which uses tickets for authentication, and it has six steps. The first step is the AS request. In this step, the client sends something called pre-authentication data, which is a timestamp blob encrypted by a hashed password of the user. This, this data is later checked by the DC, uh, by the KDC, with the key distribution center, which verifies the timestamp blob, it decrypts it using the hashed password which stores on it in this database. And if it's accurate, then the KDC will provide a TGT, ticket granting ticket, and a session key. And later on, those TGT and session key will be used in a TGS request together with the resource you want to access to, and the KDC will validate them again and will issue a TGS, which is a ticket granting service with a new session key, which allows you to now access the, your specific resource that you wanted to access using a Kerberos AP request. And later on, the, client, the resource you access to will respond with a Kerberos AP response with an error or successful authentication. And in Kerberos PK init, the main difference is in the two uh, first messages, in the Kerberos AS request and the AS response. The, this, the, this extension allows you to use certificates to authenticate to another, to your domain, instead of using your hashed password. So in this case, the pre-authentication data in the AS request will be changed in a way that instead of using your hashed password to, to encrypt the, the timestamp, instead you will use your certificate, your private key, to sign a specific blob, which is called the PK Authenticator, and you will send it to the DC. The DC will validate the certificate authority and everything about the certificate, including that it's still valid, and we'll try to verify the signed data. If it's, uh, if it's verified using the public key, then the KDC will now return a ticket and the new and a session key. And now the session key, different from the normal cables, can be or a session key generated by the KDC and encrypted using the, the public key. Or it could be derived by the Diffie-Hellman parameters, which were sent by the, uh, in the AS request and are sent back in the AS response too. So we have two options for the session key. And this is the main difference between Kerberos and Kerberos PK. And the next authentication protocol is PKU2U, which is public key user to user. And this protocol allows us to use Kerberos messages for a authentication without a KDC. So it means that we can now access a, perform a peer-to-peer -peer authentication without a KDC. So instead of going to the KDC and requesting tickets every time we want to authenticate or to access a specific resource, we will now go directly to the resource itself and ask for a ticket from him. So it's put out the KDC from the equation and let you go work directly against your resource and work with Kerberos tickets without doing any change. And in this case, it will, instead of using the hash password, you will be able to use Kerberos PK, uh, PK in it, which allows you to use the certificate. 
And our last authentication protocol, it's already familiar, GSS API or SSPI, which is a security support provider interface, which allows you to add an authenticity layer for your protocol. So for example, over RPC or SMB, you will be able to add Kerberos or NTLM authentication, and it will allow you to perform this authentication on top of your protocol. So how it all mixed out together in NegoX. So NegoX, as I mentioned, is the authentication protocol on, for authenticating to Azure AD joint devices. And, sorry. And it, and it works with the GSS API and Kerberos and PKU to you messages. So how it works is that when you want to authenticate over SMB, for example, you will use GSS API to provide an interface for NegoX, and over NegoX, you will send a PKU to you messages to authenticate to the client. So NegoX is an authentication protocol, as I mentioned, in which is enabled by default on every Azure AD joint device from, I think, a very previous version of, uh, of Windows 10, and by default on every Windows 11. And once you are when your, once your machine is onboarded to, is joined to Azure AD, then only two protocols are provided for authentication and are NTLM and NegoX. As I mentioned before, NTLM will not work since you, by default, will not have local accounts. So only NegoX left to perform any authentication to another Azure AD joint device. And this protocol have three three main uh, stages. The first stage is the initiating messages. Later on, uh, the next stage is the authentication messages. And the last step is the verification messages. Let's dive quickly over the messages, see how they work, and how this protocol works. So the first message is sent from the client to the server. And this message called initiate or nego. In case of nego X, the terms have been changed a bit, and client is now called the initiator, or uh, but I will call it as client because it's easier for us. And the server is called acceptor. It's the same. It's just a change in the world. So the initiator nego have only one purpose, and it's to contain random. This random will identify this specific session, and it will be used later for checksum in the, verify, in the verification part, which is the last part of the authentication in NegoX. The second message, which is also sent from the client to the server, is the initiator metadata, which contains metadata on the, on the authentication materials that are going to be used. So in this case, you can see that in the XDAMP we have token signing publicly. It means that we are going to use a certificate and MS organization P2P access. This is the certificate authority which we are going to be used. And this is Azure AD P2P certificate. This is the certificate that is being used in NegoX. And then once the server receives those two messages, it will respond with the same two messages, but now they will be called acceptor nego and acceptor metadata. And they will be the same messages. The acceptor nego will contain a different random from the initiator one, and the acceptor metadata will contain uh, the same metadata information, which is generated from GSS query metadata. And this is the initiating part of NegoX protocol. It doesn't really do anything. You can just send anything you want as long as it's valid. And the second part is the authentication part. This part, the, the first message which is being sent from the client to the server is the AP request. It's not a Kerberos AP request, but a NegoX AP request. It's a new uh, message type. And this message type contains the exchange data which contains inside of it a PKU to you part. And the PKU to you part in the first AP request, in, the, in this first message, will contain Kerberos PK init AS request. And this request, as I mentioned before, will be Kerberos PK init with the certificate of the client, of the Azure ID P2P certificate. And in this case, the session key will be generated by diffie Hellman parameters. So it's important to us to know later on because we will use it in one of the attacks, the fact that we cannot have the session key. And the next message is being sent back from the server to the client after the AP request was sent, and this is called the challenge message. This message again contains a PKU to you part, but in this case, the PKU to you part is PK init 
a cable speaking init AS response. And in this case, you can see that the server responds with a ticket, and this ticket contains a realm which is, which is well known PKU to you. It's not the same as the domain, but it's a default one for every, every server and every resource you will contact. And again, it, as I mentioned, it will contain the DFL DFL parameters, which will be extracted by the client and will be used later to generate the shared session key. And once this message is being sent to the client, the client forge another IP request with the ticket, with the ticket received from the server. But in this case, the IP request, it's the same uh, name, but the pku you part is different. It will now contain an AP request, a normal Kerberos AP request, with the message, uh, with the ticket, and you will be performing the authentication in this part. And then the server will respond with another challenge message, which is now the PKU to you part of Kerberos AP response again. And in this step, if everything works, then the authentication in, the, in this part is um, successful or fail. But even if it's successful, it doesn't mean that the successful authentication of NegoX uh, is established, but it only means that the, the, uh, this part is uh, established. So we have another part, and the part is called uh, Verify. It's the very, it, this is the last part of the authentication in NegoX, and this is the Verify message. And the Verify message contains a check checksum over the previous set of messages. In this case, you can see that the sequence number of this message is seven, and since we started from zero, then it means that we are going to perform a checksum here over the last seven messages. The messages are the initiate or nego, initiate or metadata, accept or nego, accept or metadata, AP request, challenge, and another AP request. They are all will be checksumed, and the checksum will be provided in the verify message. And in this step, this is a verify message which is sent from the client to the server, and the, the server will verify the checksum, and if it's, if it's accurate, then it will respond to another checksum uh, with another verify message which contains a checksum, but in this case, the checksum will be different because it will uh, perform a checksum over a different set of messages, so not only those seven. And the checksum key is a bit speci special. You cannot understand what, how this checksum key is generated by using the documentation. Uh, in this step, you need to, what I did to find out what the checksum key is to debug the L LSAS while I'm using NegoX and performing an authentication. And then I figure out that the checksum key is sent by the client or by the server. Depends on who is sending the verify message and the checksum key is, gen is sent in the Kerberos AP request or AS res AP response and is being used for the, check the checksum. So if you cannot open the Kerberos messages, you cannot get the checksum key. So this was the NegoX protocol. And now that we have a good understanding of NegoX protocol, let's see what we can do with it to perform some attacks that will allow you, us to perform lateral movement to another Azure AD joint device. So first attack, it's probably sound very similar uh, because it is very similar. It's called NegoX and it's similar to obviously NTLM relay. And this attack relies on the fact that Again, the server and the client does not verify each other, so you can just say, I'm the server or I'm the client if you made a, if you enabled and spoofed or anything else. And then, since you can perform a, any relay that you want, the relay will be the same as in NTLM, where you will just relay the messages from one side to another. But again, it's not the same uh, protocol as NTLM, so let's see how it works and what we can do differently, or what we should do differently. So as I mentioned before, the, two, uh, the first part is the initiating messages, so those messages are just being sent. I will not go over them because uh, they have no real meaning. We don't really need them in this attack. So we just relay them as is and continue. And in this case, we are starting the authentication part and we have two, uh, two scenarios. The first scenario is where we receive the AP request from the client and we choose to relate as is. If we choose to relate as is, as you can see in the Kerberos request body, there is a special field called the address, 
which contains the client name. And by default, this field will be, will contain the client name of the machine initiated the, and generated this API request. So if we'll choose to relay it as is, it's okay, it will work. We'll just relay to the server and the server will validate the API request and responds with a challenge message. The challenge message which, which will be again relayed to the client because we cannot open it because we don't have the session key since as I mentioned it generated by the Feldman and we cannot generate or find the key. So we'll just relay to the client and in the second scenario we want to be a bit more sophisticated and we want to change the client name to avoid some detections assuming that someone is detecting it. And what we'll do is to change the client name because if someone sees the original client name and the attacker IP, uh, he can easily understand that this is not uh, matching and we will be uh, seen. So in this case, we can modify the API request and relay it as is uh, to the server and the same process will happen. We will get the challenge and relay it to the client. And the next step is the API request and the verify message which are being sent from the client to the server and in this case, we don't need to modify the API request. In the first scenario, we did not modify anything, so we again relay it as is. The server verifies the verify message and the API request, and if it's okay, then the server will respond with a challenge message and a verify message. And in this case, if it's okay, the session will be already established between the attacker and the server. And since we are attackers and we don't need those two messages, we can just drop them, close the session with the client, and we have an established connection with the server. And in the second case, in the second scenario, we chose to change the client name in the previous uh, message. So now we will have the verify message which contains the checksum, but now the checksum will not be accurate since we uh, changed one of the messages. So in this case, if we will send it to the server, we will get an invalid parameter error, a negox invalid parameter error, so we will not be able to use it, and the session will be closed. So in this case, what we are going to use to do is to force the client to authenticate to us again. And if the client will authenticate to us again, Again, two, the initiating messages will be sent to, uh, to the server, and uh, we will relay them as is, and then since, we, since the client already have a ticket for us, and as you know in Kerberos, client uh, tickets are stored on the client, and if the client remember that he have a ticket for the server, then he will not request a new one. So we will use that, and since we initiate another uh, session, and the client already have a ticket to the attacker, then the client will directly use it instead of asking a new ticket. So in this case, the client will go directly to the second set of messages, the AP request and the verify. In this case, the AP request is the Kerberos AP request in the PKU to you part, and the verify message will contain a checksum which is made over those four messages and this AP request. And as you saw, we did not make any modification. So the verify message is now accurate. And the API request is also accurate because it's generated by the ticket using the session key which is known to the client. So if we will relay them to the server, then the server will validate everything and we will establish a connection because all the messages are accurate. So in this case, we managed to bypass the validation part of NegoX without knowing any session key or without knowing any secret. So let's demo this, this one real quick. Let's hope it will work. It takes a couple of seconds due to Wi-Fi. It's connectly remoting to Israel, so it takes time. In the meantime, I will just say, if it will not work, I will show a demo which I already prepared in advance. Uh, but I will say that for now that I have, uh, I'm going to show and I will have three machines. One of them will be my attacker machine. Uh, the, oh, it works. 
So here it is. I have uh, client six, which is my attacker machine, uh, which is going to run the relay server. Client seven is Azure AD join device, and it's going to be my victim machine. And client eight is going to be my target, my target machine. So it means that client seven is going to authenticate to client six, and client six is the attacker machine, and it's going to authenticate to client eight. So uh, from client six, I will start my relay server, and I will choose to modify the name as I just showed. I will just choose a random name. Okay, so choosing a very random name, and I will start the server. And then I will also start a Wireshark. This is a special version of Wireshark which I uh, made a modification to, to pass the PKU to your messages. This is why I'm using a NegroX as filter right now. I think it will not work in a regular Wireshark if you're trying it uh, yourself. And then instead of spoofing, I will directly log authenticate to my attacker machine from the, vic from the victim machine. And let's take a look on, uh, on the, the server. So as you can see, we managed to dump some hashes. Uh, in this case, the hashes, hashes will not give me anything because as I mentioned, it's a device without local accounts, but it just proved that we have an authenticated connection. And since we have in sufficient privilege to the victim machine, we managed to dump those hashes similar to NTLM relay. And let's take a look real quick on the traffic. So if we will open the traffic and we will see the AP request which contains the Kerberos PK init uh, AS request and we'll open everything and we will go directly to the request body and to the address field now we can see that this is client 7 this is what we have received from the original uh, client and then what we relayed is the new name that I just wrote. And if I will follow this uh, stream of packets, we will see that I've relayed it as is uh, without modifying the verify message and I've received an error. So what I did next is to force the client to authenticate again to me as a attacker. And this gave me, as I showed you, let's follow this. And now we can see that in the new session, we have received the two initiating messages. We, this is the only part of the relay. I'm not showing uh, the client side, but only to the server side. And we see that we just went directly into the AP request and the verify. And then the session is established and we managed to authenticate. So we managed to bypass the validation part and let's see how it looks on a the target device. So we can see in the target device that we have a Windows 4624 of successful authentication and we have the account name with the domain of Azure ID and you can see the full UPN of my account. And if we will go to the authentication package, we can see that the, it was being used in, with Negro Extender and now we can see that the workstation name is what I just wrote and the IP is my attacker machine IP and not the client. So we managed to perform a successful authentication to the machine, even though we made modification to the Kerberos messages, which are being protected by the NegroX verify message. So we still managed to bypass them, bypass the verification part, so nice for us. And let's go back to the next attack. Okay, so the next attack, it's not really attack yet, it's the preparation for the attack. In this case, we will use the primary refresh token, the PRT, to get a P2P Azure ID certificate. So how we will do it, we will first generate a CSR, which is a certificate signing request for the specific user, which the PRT is bound to. And then we will attach both the CSR and the primary refresh token to a JWT, a JSON web token, and we will sign this JSON web token with the session key bound to the specific PRT. Once we have it, once we uh, signed it, we can send this JWT to Azure ID, and then we will receive uh, the certificate, 
in the X5C section, and we've received an Azure AD P2P certificate, which is going to be valid for the next one hour. And since we have a valid P2P certificate, what we will do, we will just simulate everything and pass this certificate to another machine. And as long as we will have permissions, we will be able to simulate the SMB messages and perform the networks authentication and authenticate to another machine. This will allow us to jump to another machine, get certificates, and we can dump those certificates from the local machine store because they are by default stored in the machine store, or we can dump the PRTs, or we can do anything else. We can also add rogue Azure AD joint devices, uh, which will allow us to get constantly a PRT and get the new Azure AD certificates. And it will allow us to move to another machines every time we want and harvest some more and more PRTs and certificates and move to another machine every time. So now we saw a couple of attacks that allow us to move laterally between devices. Let's see how we can hunt for those attacks. Our first option is to use Windows Event. We can use Windows Event 4624 or 4625. Uh, to hunt for a successful or failed authentication. 4624 is for successful authentication, while 4625 is for failed authentications. And as I showed in the demo, we will have the Azure ID account in the domain and the full UPN. And the authentication package is network standard. It's important to know. And then we will have the workstation name and the IP, as I mentioned. And in this case, I have attached a screenshot from a a real machine. So in this case, the attacker did not modify the name. So if you see and have a mapping between the workstation, uh, workstation names and the IPs, you can easily understand that this is a malicious connection because the IP does not match to the name. So it's easy to uh, hunt for suspicious logins with, or also you can find a weird authentication from another devices with users that are not supposed to be connected to those devices. The second option is to use the traffic analysis. Uh, there are plenty of uh, open source traffic analysis or anything else. And you can use them to parse the PKUTU part. And if you parse the PKUTU part, you can extract the serial number and the subject. This will allow you to find cases where the same serial number have been used from two devices. And in the case of the relay attack, or in case of someone stealing uh, the the P2P certificate from the machine, you will be able to see that this serial number was being used from two different devices, uh, not even in the same time. It could be in frame of one hour because this is the time the certificate is valid. And it will help you find some more suspicious attempts. And the mitigation parts, uh, as you may know, you cannot mitigate someone stealing your uh, credentials. Uh, PRT and Azure AD P2P certificates are the same as your uh, password. So if someone steal your password, I cannot really do anything, and you cannot really protect your device. You can obviously patch the device. It will be harder for tools like Mimikatz to harvest the PRT, uh, but there is no other way. And the second option to mitigate the network uh, relay when it's done over SMB, you can, uh, you can enable the SMB signing. This will force the attacker to use, to sign the SMB messages, and since the attacker does not have the session key, and it cannot get the session key because the first session key is generated from the fielman, then the attacker will not be able to sign the messages, and the relay will still work, the attacker will still be able to authenticate to the device, but the attacker will not be able to do anything on the device itself. So it will force him to close the connection. So the tools have been used are the Negrex relay, which I just demo. And the second tool is the Azure D certificate request tool, which is the PRT to certificate. The third tool, the last tool, is the pass the certificate authentication tool with Azure D certificate. And for research, I've used Wireshark. Uh, I modified Wireshark to add the sector for the PKU to you part over Negrex and allow you to find networks uh, messages easier. And then I also modified Zeek to parse GSS API, networks over GSS API to extract the, the PKU to your messages, the serial numbers and everything from the certificate itself. It's all available in GitHub, uh, so 
you can download it and use it to find and research on your own. And the last takeaway is from this session. Uh, as I mentioned, since the, some part is stealing your certificates or anything else, then patching is not really enough. It will not protect you from everything, but it's still mandatory to use the SMB signing since this is the thing that will protect you against the relay. Uh, as I mentioned, it's something new. I, I did not, I don't know if someone is using it right now, I, but it's a way, new way to perform lateral movement and since we all know that domain lateral movement is being used for years, then I assume that it will also be used. We already know that attackers are joining new device to Azure AD, so since they are already joining new device, it means that they can get a P2P certificate, so they are one step from authenticating to your device. And the last thing is hunting. As I said, it's, it's a new attack surface, and so it's very important to track and search if there are successful authentications since there are no, uh, not enough research in this area. So it's extremely important. And that's it. Thank you. And